Hello and welcome to Viral History. This week we're at the Daily Mail Chalk Valley History Festival in Salisbury on this glorious day. We're here with Helen Castor. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really a pleasure to have you. Uh, I understand you're doing a talk in just a few hours time. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that popular image that everyone has of Elizabeth I. She's an icon really, isn't she? I mean, everyone can picture her. But the pictures we have in our head tend to be the images from the later part of her life. They're not necessarily her looking old, she wasn't keen on looking old, <laughs> um, but they are very much Gloriana. Um, the Queen in Majesty decked about with not only the richest clothes you could imagine, but also symbols, uh, the symbols of the Virgin Queen. And what I think it's important to remember is that there was nothing inevitable about Elizabeth's story, her life turning out that way. She lived in profound uncertainty. And the very fact that she created that image so powerfully and so consciously, I think is a response to the uncertainty in which she lived. Uncertainty that was partly a matter of her own psychological development, her own personal experiences, but also then the situation in which she found herself as a woman ruling alone. Um, and so the, the Virgin Queen as an icon is a deliberate response to that. And I believe your talk is going to demystify that image that we all have of her. I'm going to try, um, because I think one of the things that happens when we write about history sometimes is that the most familiar stories take on a life of their own as though, almost as though they're a fairy tale. I mean, I'm not suggesting we really tell history like a fairy tale, but particularly the Tudors, the great soap opera of, yeah. of English history. And we know the story of Henry VIII and his six wives, divorced, beheaded, survived. Um, no, that's wrong. Divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, yeah. beheaded, survived. <laughs> and because we know what's coming, I think sometimes we fail to think about the human reality of it. So what I'm trying to talk about is the effect on a very young girl of a situation where her father, the king, has her mother killed before she's three. And we know that's an early stage in the story of Henry and his six wives, but Elizabeth didn't know that and Anne Boleyn didn't know that. Before Anne Boleyn, before she went to the block in 1536, I haven't been able to find a single English noblewoman, let alone an anointed queen as Anne was, who was judicially executed, judicially murdered, we could say, in Anne's case, because she was certainly not guilty of exactly what she was charged with. And so Elizabeth finds herself in an unprecedented position. We can't demonstrate the psychological effects in detail. If we could only had the secret diary of Elizabeth, age 13 and three quarters, we might stand a chance. But she was someone who wore a mask from a very early age. But I suppose what I'm trying to do is interpret her silence mm. and say that the very fact that she wore a public mask from a very early age seems to me to be indicative of the profound uncertainty, insecurity, and actually a lot of the time danger in which she lived. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about Elizabeth I's death, because there are some theories that say that all that heavy makeup that she wore to look youthful, even in her older age, uh, full of lead and mercury, and that potentially that was a cause of her death. Certainly, the type, the nature, the composition of the makeup that she wore in ever increasing quantities in the later years of her life cannot have been good for her. Um, there was mercury, there was lead, there were, there were all sorts of, of, of problematic things uh, in some of the treatments um, that were used by both physicians and, and then in cosmetics at that point. So I think we could possibly speculate that some of her, her moods, um, her behaviour in those last years of her life when she's described as being um, increasingly irascible. Uh, she'd always been mercurial though. Um, uh, she'd always been difficult um, as queen in that she, she was both very commanding and yet deliberately indecisive. Um, she, she, she'd always been a difficult person to, to judge. It's possible that had an effect. On the other hand, we have to remember she lived to be 69, yes. and that's quite some age uh, in, the, in mm. the 16th, early 17th century. Yeah. So I'm always wary of conspiracy theories in history. Um, they can be very beguiling, but I think we have to be a little bit careful before diving in with both feet. We can say the makeup certainly wasn't good for her, but I 
think her health was declining anyway by the time the, the last couple of years came. And supposedly it took her four hours or so in the, every morning to put that makeup on and project that image, that youthful image. Um, and I believe that some of the portraits that she had done in her later life, she had discarded or they didn't portray the way she wanted to look. It certainly became clear that realistic portraits in the last couple of decades of her life were not what the Queen wanted to see. There's a wonderful portrait, the rainbow portrait, um, one of the great images of the latter part of her reign, painted when she was in her 60s, and there is no way you would know. You would, right. no, you would never be able to say that as a portrait of a 60-something-year-old woman, completely unlined face, that gets called the mask of youth in these, in, in these paintings, and also a very low-cut dress and, and, and so on. Um, Again, this I think is to do not only with her personal psychology, but also the political situation in which she found herself. She had no direct heir. Uh, if you have created your control of the present through a persona that you've developed as the Virgin Queen, it, 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 it's a, a way of dealing with a woman ruling alone that, ha that, that works in the present in, in a um, fascinating and very powerful way but it does mean you've had to abdicate any control over the future. And no king would ever have had to make that choice. Kings can marry and have children and not actually put themselves in physical danger. I think we have to remember that childbirth was very dangerous. So all those people pressing Elizabeth to marry and have children, well, Elizabeth very well knew that the outcome of that could be not only no heir, but no queen either, if, if the pregnancy went badly wrong. Um, but as a result, in her 60s, clearly death was approaching and there was no certainty for the kingdom about what would happen next. Now, I happen to think that she played that insecurity very cleverly. Right. Um, but uh, what she, the image she was trying to portray, I mean, one of her um, most powerful mottos was semper eadem in Latin, always the same. And that was very much what she was trying to convey. You're absolutely right, thick layers of makeup almost to the point of being glazed. Mm -hmm. I mean, egg white was being used to sort of set this mask um, and enormously elaborate costumes that did take a couple of hours for her to be laced into and wigs and so on. But it, it, it was a, a performance of yeah. sovereignty um, that helped to hold the present in place even while the unknowability of the future mm -hmm. was uh, an unnerving prospect. And I have to ask, Virgin Queen? I absolutely believe she was. Yeah. I mean, there are people who would argue, but it, Elizabeth, who was extraordinarily conscious of risk and of danger, mm. and I think I've, uh, my perspective is that that lay behind her decision not to marry, which I think was in place from very early. I mean, she said a lot of different things and she participated in diplomatic rituals of courtship and so on, but she chose not to marry and if you choose not to marry, and one of the reasons you're choosing not to marry may well be that you don't want to put your physical safety at risk through childbirth, however tempting it might be, sex outside marriage is infinitely more risky. So she loved male company, she loved having her favourites around her, she loved a handsome young man, <laughs> but I cannot see someone as risk averse as I think Elizabeth was, letting herself go even for a moment. <laughs> And I have to ask, because two of the viral history team are from Nottinghamshire, what's your fascination with Bess of Hardwick? Oh, she's one of, uh, one of the great powerful women um, of the 16th century. I think there's so much to be interested in, in Bess. Um, the, the ambition, the uh, determination, the vision of what she wanted for her family uh, and what she eventually wanted for Arbella uh, Stewart. Um, so the, the, the drive, the ambition, but also, of course, then the fact that her story intersects not only with Elizabeth's but with Mary Queen of Scots. And that, that double story, Elizabeth and Mary Queen of Scots, is one that never loses its, its fascination. So in a way, I mean, people sometimes ask, why are we fascinated with the story of the Tudors? And I have a variety of answers to that. <laughs> um, one of them would be Holbein. Yes. I think we can, see, we can see the faces of these people in a way we haven't been able to mm. before. But another is actually that Tudor history is extraordinarily um, female-centric. There are so many strong, charismatic, brilliant in different ways women um, involved in politics across the century. And Bess is, um, you know, it's Margaret Douglas, um, the Anglo-Scots 
realm. There, there are a whole number of them, very ambitious, dynastically minded uh, women whose stories all intersect in different ways. And it's interesting that you mention powerful women in history. And this year, of course, there's a big, a big um, push around women's rights and female members of history that have been written out of history in somewhat. What, what are your thoughts on that and how do you find that influences your work? Oh, it's extremely important to my work. And I mean, it's, it's extremely important to history, I think, that, that we are, you know, I mean, obviously in this year of this centenary of, of, of some women getting the vote in this country, um, but also in terms of the events in our contemporary world. Uh, when I first was writing She Wolves, a um, book about medieval and Tudor queens, which I wrote um, in the years leading up to 2010 when it first came out, it felt to me as though it was a subject with a deep contemporary re resonance and relevance, but perhaps not one that was at the forefront of the way we thought about things. We had at that point a male prime minister, we'd had Margaret Thatcher, but you know, and there were women involved in politics increasingly, but it didn't feel quite such a sharply focused issue. And I think in the years since 2010, it's only become more and more and more acutely relevant. I think we only have to look at the uh, last American election to see how, uh, see the, the nature of the difficulties that Hillary Clinton encountered as a candidate for the most powerful office on earth. Mm. Um, to see that not a lot at some deep level has changed in our response mm. to women stepping forward to put themselves forward as leaders. Final question, if you had to choose one character from history, medieval or not, who would you choose? One person one to be person. my favourite. <laughs> it would be a final runoff, I think, between Eleanor of Aquitaine right. and Elizabeth I. Um, <laughs> it's difficult to choose between them. We need to do a top trumps. Uh, we lineup. need to do a top trumps lineup, but but <laughs> at this moment today, don't hold me to this forever. <laughs> I, I find it hard to see past Elizabeth. Yeah. I can see why. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank chatting. Thank you very much. Thank you.